Our gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Listen to the word of God. Soon afterwards, he, being Jesus, went into a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us. And God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. May God surprise us with God's word on this day. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, for you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Before my surgery, I went up to my folks and dropped my dog off for a few days, my dog Robbie. And as I was driving back from my parents' home, I decided I hadn't listened to many of the Baltimore, I grew up in Baltimore, many of the Baltimore radio stations in a long time, so I wanted to hear what genre of music the radio stations I had grown, with, grown up with were now offering. I mean, B104 and, and 101.9 WLIF. You see, I grew up listening to WLIF 101.9 because that's what my parents played in the radio in the car. We sat in the back seat, they in the front seat, they had control of the radio. It was WLIF. And back in the 70s, it was labeled as the easy listening station. Kind of a combination of like 60s music that my parents knew, but not, but more like Muzak, a form of Muzak. That was WLIF, the easy listening station in Baltimore back in the day. So I listened to 101.9, it was still called WLIF, and so I realized they were playing 80s music. So I'm like singing along in the car, I had my hands on the steering wheel. But I was, I was singing along on my, on my way back, and, um, and then during a commercial break, I heard it. They said, this is WLIF, playing your favorite oldies. <laughs> I'm like, oldies? What do you mean oldies? It was just yesterday that we were in the 80s, right? How dare I fit the demographic of the oldies station? When did that happen? So if the 80s are now the oldies, what does it mean when I began singing a Three Dog Night song called One from 1969 as I studied the scripture for today? One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. I won't sing it, but it's probably in your head now if you know it, so. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. A song about a breakup, about hearing the words no, and how hearing the word no is the saddest experience you'll ever know, K and O W. One is the loneliest number. One may very well have been the loneliest number as that funeral procession left town, the town of Maine, to head outside the gates to bury her one and only son. We don't know if she had any daughters, and really economically it didn't matter. Just as this procession heads outside of the gates, this widow is now on the outside of what once had been. What once was a greater chance of economic security when she was married, and then even after her husband died, her son had the responsibility of taking care of her. Now, now she found herself on the outside at the mercy of the surplus kindness of neighbors. 
You see, for Luke, widows are the victim of a cruel economic system that provides them few ways for them to merely survive. But here she is, not by choice, in another funeral procession, first for her husband, and now for her only son. I can't imagine what this woman is feeling. The loss, the pain of losing her son, and that looming dreaded question that so many have after a loved one dies, what do I do now? But in this moment, she follows the deer, the stretcher, with her son, her only son on it. And as this procession heads out, there is another procession heading in toward the town. And after healing the centurion servant that we heard a couple weeks ago, Jesus has left Capernaum with this large crowd following him. He's on his way to Nain, and along his way he sees this funeral procession. And as this funeral procession proceeds, Jesus is touched. He's moved by what is happening. As Luke says, he has compassion for her, or as the Message Bible says, his heart broke. I can imagine Jesus reaching out to this mother, holding her and encouraging her. Now, he tells her not to cry, which is probably not what I would have learned in pastoral care and counseling. So, probably not the most helpful thing for Jesus to say to her in that moment. How dare he tell me not to cry? But she had no idea what was going to come next. Suddenly hushed, the crowd watches as Jesus calls those carrying the stretcher forth. He reaches out and he touches the stretcher and makes a command for the young man to get up and walk. And this dead man gets up and begins to talk and listen to this. Jesus gives him back to his mother. And the crowd is amazed and astonished. The mother does. She turns her tears of weeping into tears of joy. And I imagine weeping. Someone with a tambourine probably comes forth and begins to sing and dancing begins. All are amazed at what has happened. And they declare that surely this man, Jesus, is from God. And that God has come to God's people. Jesus has compassion and his heart broke for this widow. Not only because she grieves the loss of her son, but also because this funeral of dirge in a way marked her death in some significant sense. His death meant the life of uncertainty and financial calamity for her. And her son's death meant that one truly was going to be the loneliest number for her. Jesus is so moved by her plight and tells her not to weep. This is why he demonstrates to her that her life, she knows it is not drawing to a close. He reaches out to her in her sorrow, in the midst of her loneliness. He intrudes into the scene of death and hopelessness and sees the widow's tears as a cry of anguish and boldly brings her, her son from death to life. And he brings her from death to life as well. In other words, I think for Luke, resurrection is not just the resuscitation of a dead body, but the invigoration of people and their communities in God's righteousness and justice. Who better to receive this gift than a widow on the very brink of death? Perhaps you know what loneliness feels like. Maybe you were like the widow living with the question of what next is going to be socially and economically. When asked this question this week, what times you feel lonely and when, what, are time, what are times you feel comforted, some of you said that you feel most lonely when the, as the sun sets, darkness begins and all seems quiet and still. Or leaving home for the first time to a new state. We're going through something no one else can relate to as lonely. Discovering you're not the only one shatters that loneliness. Someone else said, I think the times I felt the loneliest were times when I was surrounded by people. Being an introvert, I'm not always comfortable in crowds. If I'm not interacting with someone I know, it can be desperately lonely for me. Another person said, when you don't yet know where you fit, 
We all need to find our tribe, and until you do, it can be very lonely. And this person said, I felt lonely when surrounded by others who all seem to not be alone. People who are partnered in family groups with best friends. I felt invisible then. I felt comforted. I felt comforted when I felt that someone sees me, really sees me. And maybe that is the most important, is that we have a need, a desire to be seen. And that's what Jesus did. He saw the widow. He saw her need. And he restored her into community. Into a life of economic security had a new possibility. And I want you to know that Jesus sees each of us. Each of you. His name was Sean, a seventh grader who showed up to a Cairo church camp one summer. We were in northern Indiana, and it was a typical week of camp. Hot, humid, mosquitoes, hot, humid, and God. Sean arrived, as most any kids do, a sleeping bag and pillow in hand with stuff that seemed to be stuffed into a, a sack. I guess it was his clothes for the week. He was a resistor in everything. Everything we did, small group, he was angry. Mealtime, yelling. Small group, not participatory. Time to come eat, no it's not, I can do whatever I want. He tested the nerve of every counselor on staff. And he tested the nerves of this co-director as well. It was easy to meet his anger with stern anger right back. And then something happened. I think, I was trying to remember this, I think it was in preparing for the talent show, the small group devised this skit where they were going to pretend that a haircut had gone bad and they would have this reveal that this hair was gone and then suddenly they would reveal that a kid was bald. I don't know how they were going to do this, but Sean decided that it would be really cool if he could be the one who was bald, and he wanted to literally shave his head. What to do as a co-director? <laughs> because the child, that now that it, can a child shave his head is not listed as a can or can't do in the church director camp manual. Let me just say that. And after some prayer and consultation, I said yes, with the stipulation from my other co-director that I had to be the one to greet his mother at the end of camp. <laughs> Once the yes was given, Sean and the small group bonded. He was having fun. They all found razors and started shaving his head. He participated. He was no longer a number one. He was no longer the loneliest number. Because he was seen. He was cared for. And I'm convinced he experienced God's unconditional love. I still had to face his mom. And of course, his mother was one of the last parents to arrive. See, at camp, all the parents, there's like this whole group of parents that the first rush, and the kids are all happy, and they go off. And then there's always that one or two campers where the parents take forever to show up. This was Sean's mom. I pulled her aside before she could see her son's bald head, and I explained her to her about the week, and then that I shared with her that I had given permission for Sean to shave his head, and I apologized profusely. I was almost on my knees apologizing. And she interrupted me and she said, Steve, this is nothing. This is not, This is a gift. His hair can grow back. I'm just glad that he was loved and accepted. We don't have pictures, just stories. And I don't think any of us can imagine the loneliness, the number one-ness, 
the children are feeling are being detained. Let alone the parents worrying about their children and even the workers trying to care for these kids who feel that they are going, doing their best but without resources necessary and who may be even afraid to speak out. And as we hear the stories of the conditions in these detention centers of the immigrants, does your heart break? God might does. If Jesus saw what was happening, I'm sure his heart would be breaking too. As I believe God's heart is breaking now. How might we practice compassion? What do we need to let go of that we've constructed about these folks? That we need to be able to practice compassion. I wrote about it in, in your bulletin this morning. Pray. Pray. Write or call or email our government officials demanding that conditions change. And then we can educate ourselves about the whole issue of immigration and why folks are sending their children, either accompanied or unaccompanied, to our country. And then we can seek opportunities to practice compassion, to listen, to walk alongside, to empower and be empowered by not just these kids that seem so far off, but people within our own communities who are most vulnerable in our midst. Who is a number one among us? Are you a number one as the loneliest number just yearning to be loved? Because Jesus sees you. And in this place, we try to cultivate a community where, as the hands and feet of Jesus, we are a place that says you are loved no matter who you are. And from this place, we can be people who practice compassion for others and with others. The widow bearing her son, the troubled youth at church camp, and children who are detained. It can sure feel overwhelming and can wear us down. But it can begin so small. Just like, just like when you toss that stone in a lake and the ripples come out. That's the way ripples of compassion can spread. So that in the end, one doesn't have to be the loneliest number. Amen.